Hello guys, we're going to do a PowerPoint um, show here that basically gets you from chapter 4 as the Roman Empire had ended and then kind of bridges you over to chapter 6 where you're going to have medieval times. We skip chapter 5, as I said before, it goes a lot deeper into um, into the East and Byzantine Empire and Islam and stuff than I think is necessary for our Western, um, you know, this class is, is generally called Western Sib. So I'd like to stick with that, but I also don't want to leave you hanging without any information from the period between chapters four and chapter six. So this is my attempt at that. So oh, Diocletian, okay, this guy, there's a lot to him, a lot more than we'll be able to go into, but from what we know of him, he was born of at least, you know, common birth, not a noble, and he's going to end up becoming a guy who rose up in the military because of his talent. So. He became a sort of, I guess, a well, a high-ranking commander in one of the emperor's armies. And then after the emperor died and then the emperor's son died, Diocletian was next in line. He was proclaimed emperor, okay? So what we see with Diocletian, we have good and we have bad, okay? So a lot of times when you read about Diocletian, you're going to read about how his empire when he took over in 284, ended the crisis of the third century. Okay, the crisis of the third century is a time where you had basically the Roman Empire almost, you know, um, collapsing, falling, going away in the West. Now we're basically talking about the West, okay, because we're gonna we're gonna see that the East and the Western sections of the Roman Empire are going to be so, so different. So anyway, um, he's going he's gonna to end this crisis of the third century, which involved, you know, some of the reasons why it almost fell then was the German invasions. We're going to talk a lot about the German invasions in the next couple of chapters, the Germanic peoples, also known as the barbarians. And you're going to have civil wars, you're going to have all sorts of anarchy and all kinds of things. So Diocletian is going to come in again in 284, and he is going to be the ruler in the east, okay? So Diocletian's over in the east, and then he appoints another military man, a friend of his, who had you know, risen also on merit, he appoints Maximon as what they called an Augustus. Now, the Augustus, you know, that, that we've talked about was a title. Well, it's also a title. In this period of time, by the time we've hit 204, or I'm sorry, 284 AD, you've got Augustus meaning co-emperor, okay? So Diocletian is going to be in the east, Maximon is going to be in the west. And Diocletian is then going to appoint two more guys as what they called Caesars. Okay, now Caesars were basically junior co-emperors. Okay, it came from the name, the family of Julius Caesar, but... It's going to start to be a title somewhere around the time of the death of Nero. You're going to see the, the um, word, the familial name, Caesar, being used as a title in the Roman Empire. So in this case, Diocletian has put in these two guys as junior co-emperors. You know, one of them is under him and Maximon has another one. So you end up with a tetrarchy. Now, tetrarchy is basically what it says on here at the very bottom, okay? A tetrarchy is a rule of four, 
Okay, so you've got all of these men who believed they were actually equal. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Tetrarchy on the next slide in just a second. But keep in mind that the empire has become so large that Diocletian knew that he had to put other guys in charge. So as they divide the empire up, you're going to have the Eastern Empire having its capital at a place called Byzantium, which was an ancient city. Okay, and we'll talk more about Byzantium also as it, it changes its name later. And the Western Empire is going to keep Rome as the symbolic symbol because, you know, the ancient city of Rome and they're not going to they're not going to stop using Rome as at least a ceremonial or symbolic symbol. So, for the third slide, I give you a definition of tetrarchy. We've already kind of I've already mentioned what that is, but this is more of a I guess more of a textbook type definition. Tetrarchy is a form of government which power is divided among four individuals system of government instituted by Diocletian that split the power between two rulers in the East and two rulers in the West, ultimately, remember. Okay? Empires divided at that point. Okay? You have an Eastern and a Western Empire. Now, you're going to have an Augustus, and then you're going to have a Caesar in each half. Okay? Now, in this context, Augustus, remember, means co-emperor, and in this context, Caesar means subordinate co-emperor. So each of these, quote, emperors are going to rule over a quarter division of the empire. That seems problematic to me from the beginning because they're each kind of, they've carved up the Roman Empire and they're each considering themselves to be pretty much equal, you know, even though we have subordinate and whatever. But it's still going to cause a lot of problems as far as the ruling body goes. Who's going who's gonna to actually be in charge of some of the decisions? Well, sometimes it was quite a struggle. Another thing we need to know about Diocletian is it's during his time that we have really the last of the big persecutions of the Christians and this is, you know, it's called the Diocletian Persecutions. It goes from about 303 to 312. And it's going to be the last, but also the most severe. This is where we're going to hear the stories of the lions literally, you know, eating the Christians in, you know, in front of people at the arenas for their um, entertainment. You're going to have Diocletian Maximon and then the other two co-emperors also signing in 303 some some documents, some some edicts, some legal papers, really, that took away the Christians' rights, okay, and demanded that they worship the gods of Rome. So we've got a map here that you can look at and see the, the division of the Roman Empire. You know, you've got the Western and then the Eastern, and you can see the dividing line between the line you know, are between the lands under Diocletian and Maximon. And you can see other things, you know, home of, you know, of Maximon. You see kind of where that is. Of course, Rome is the symbolic capital and, and everything over in the West. Um, you can also see the homes of the Caesars, the, the you know, subordinate co-emperors or whatever, and uh, the home of Diocletian and, and so on. But what it shows you is that there is a clear split now in the empire, it's just gotten too big, and it's it's been split up among these four men. Okay, I love maps, by the way, just so you know. So with Constantine, I'll make it really, you know, short and to the point. But by 313, there's only going to be two emperors left out of the Tetrarchy. That you know, that's going to be Constantine in the West and Licinius in the East. Tetrarchic system obviously is coming to an end, but it's going to take a while because Constantine's still got to finally defeat Licinius, and there's going to be several wars against Licinius, and in 313, he met Licinius in Milan, 
and that was to secure an alliance between them. And they're going to agree on this Edict of Milan, which I'll mention again in a minute. But Licinius and Constantine, you're going to end up with conflict, okay? By 320, Licinius had gone back on his support for the Edict of Milan, because the Edict of Milan, I'll just go ahead and tell you, the Edict of Milan granted tolerance to Christianity. Now, sometimes people think that Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, but he did not. What he did was he ended, along with Licinius at first anyway, ended the persecution of Christians and made it legal for them, as well as all other religions, to actually practice their faith, okay? So what you see here is Licinius, somewhere around 320, is going to start not persecuting Christians in terms of, of killing them and that type of thing. But Licinius, as he goes back on the Edict of Milan, he's going to actually try to try to run out the Christians and kind of, I don't know, trying to um, make them see that they should be part of the of the Roman, religion. Remember, it's all about the, the civic religion and the gods are going to take the um, take the protection away from the city and the empire and all that if they don't fall into line. Well, the Christians are not going to fall into line. So in 324, we're going to see that Constantine and Licinius are just in a mess. And you can read all about that stuff if you want to. I'm trying to make it a little bit shorter. But they're going to have a civil war in 324 where Licinius is going to lose. Okay, you've got Constantine winning, you know, several battles. And finally, in the late part of the year 324, Licinius is going to surrender to Constantine. Now, they were sent out really to just go back to being private citizens. However, okay, however, Licinius and his, um, you know, what, his Caesar, I guess, they had been promised that they would have their lives spared. But a few years later, or how, I guess maybe it was about the next year later, I think it was about 325, Constantine was afraid that Licinius had plotted against him. So he's going to have Licinius and his Caesar arrested and put to death. Licinius' son, even, was killed somewhere around 326. So because of all that, Constantine becomes the sole emperor of East and West. The whole Roman Empire is united under him. And again, I mentioned the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. You might want to look that up because Constantine was a pagan and Constantine, you know, the, the, the story where he sees something in the sky and he promises that if, um, you know, he sees like a, a cross in the sky and he, he feels that he's been promised that with the sign you shall win, okay, when he's fighting one of the earlier battles. And so he's going to have on the, um, he's going to have, well, first of all, I mean, he's, he's going to, in some of the historians' accounts, and it's a little bit different in some of them, but Constantine's going to have a dream. Now, you're going to hear about another dream of Constantine later, 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 as we, as we move on into another chapter or two. But anyway, Constantine supposedly had a dream the following night where Jesus himself appeared with the same sign, like a cross, right? Like a, you know, the, the way that they were looking at the cross right then. And looked a little bit different than the ones we would probably recognize today. But anyway, he 
decides that he's going to wear a helmet with the sign on it, and you're going to have Constantine deploying his forces out there, and you're going to see Constantine does win. Now, in some of the stories, he supposedly had said, yeah, well, if I do win under the sign of the Christian God, then I will convert. Now, eh, it's, again, most historians today agree that Constantine converted on his deathbed, but at the very least, he was very interested in Christianity at that time. So he's going to be the first emperor to convert at whenever point, okay, to Christianity. Now, again, Edict of Milan and Licinius and all that, you're welcome to read about that, but you just have to know the basics here. So after he was able to defeat Licinius and actually bring the two halves of the Roman Empire back together under his sole control, you're going to see that he decides, remember he was in the West, he decides that there needs to be a beautiful, magnificent city built over in the East. Now, it had already been rebuilt to some degree, and, you know, the Romans had worked on it a little bit, but Constantine is going to basically found the city anew on the site of the old Greek city of Byzantium, and he's going to rename it Constantinople, Constantine's city, okay? So the new city is going to say, yeah, in that city, they're going to say, um, some of the historians, that you can see that Constantine was a Christian, that he had already converted. But, you know, again, there's a lot of scholarly disputes about Constantine, mostly because the historians that wrote about him back in the ancient, you know, world were not consistent, right? They, they contradicted each other. But we do know that he was indeed the first to stop the persecution of Christians and to legalize Christianity. Okay, remember, Edict of Milan. So he builds Constantine's city. Now, Constantinople was then dedicated in 330. And today, it's modern-day Istanbul. And, we'll, you know, that's also, that's going to be 14... 53 is going to be a very important year later when we get up toward that direction because that's a year where so many things happen. You have the end of the Hundred Years' War. You're going to have the Muslims taking over Turkey and renaming Constantine's city as Istanbul and so on. Now, Constantine is going to serve as the sole emperor until his death in 337. Another thing before we leave Constantine behind, I usually would write on the board about the Council of Nicaea. It's N-I-C-A-E-A. -A. I can never spell that in class, but anyway, you're going to have this first Council of Nicaea called by Constantine in 325 AD, okay? Now, this is where he's come, you know, bringing all these different groups coming together through, it's called an ecumenical council. So you're going to have all these different beliefs that are out there. You're going to have people who believed that Jesus was not fully God and fully man. You're going to have some of, of that with the Aryans. And don't think of, don't think of Hitler and the Holocaust. Aryan, A-R-I-A-N, this Aryan controversy or this Aryan heresy basically said that Jesus was not God because he was created by God, okay? So that was one of the big problems they had to settle. As Christianity was growing, they needed to come up with something that would show what they believe, okay, as Christians. So the Arians, those were the ones that it was really meant to to um, to get them out of the prominent spot that, uh, that a lot of people had been following them, okay? So anyway, the Nicene Creed is going to be very important 
because this is what comes out of this first Council of Nicaea. And he's going to invite, you know, somewhere close to 2,000 bishops from the Christian church, from, you know, different parts, again, of, of the, um, the Eastern Orthodox, as it's going to become one day, and people from, you know, Antioch, and people from Alexandria, and all, all sorts of places from all over the Roman Empire. And you had a lot of them bringing priests and deacons, so we're not sure exactly how many people attended this, okay? But you are going to have a lot of powerful players that come together. Now, again, they address the concept of the Arian heresy. A heresy is going against the beliefs of the church, so that's what it's eventually going to become known as. But the Arian question they're going to say, okay, is God greater than the sun? Or was Jesus actually already existing as part of the Trinity before the world? Okay, so I'm going to do that. They're going to try to settle that, and they're, they're going to. Uh, they're also going to date the uh, time when Easter is celebrated, and all sorts of other things that they work on, okay? And we have some arguments that are presented by the Arians in terms of why they believe that Jesus was not equal to God the Father, but this is not what's accepted by the Council of Nicaea. So the Nicene Creed is going to basically say something like this, okay? Jesus Christ is described as light from light, true God from true, from true God, which shows that he was part of the Father, okay? The next part of it would be that Jesus is begotten, not made, okay? So again, true Son of God from one substance of the Father, and then of one being from the Father, true God, they're of the same being. So all of that is very important, okay, because this is going to be where we're going to have to figure out about the Trinity, okay? So the Nicene Creed is going to try to end all of this controversy, and you know, that never works. You can't just all of a sudden have everyone who believed in all these different types of beliefs of, of Arianism and some of the others, you're really not going to find a lot of them that just all of a sudden say, wow, okay. But they were talking about this. This was a big thing. So you do have a lot of people that agreed on it. So there's a lot of things that they came up with also some canons, okay? Now, canons, like C-A-N-O-N -N in the church, canon law, this is going to be some kind of regulation that is held up by the church itself, okay? The church, say in the Catholic church, you have the magisterium, for example. So, canons are going to come up as the result of the Council of Nicaea, and a couple of those, I mean, they're going to, first of all, prohibit usury among the clergy, U-S-U-R-Y, okay? That means charging interest, okay? And when we get to Dante, you're going to see that people who commit usury have a special place in hell. So, generally, usury is... a you know, it's talking about taking advantage of other people and, and charging them extraordinary interest. It makes me think immediately of the, um, what are they, the payday loan places. Immediately I think of that. And I'm sorry if any of you work at one of those, but whew, I think they're bottom feeders. I'm sorry, I have to be honest. Um, you're also going to... Uh, prohibit certain things and and 
conclude certain things as far as that goes. But this council is going to be extraordinarily important, as I said, because the long-term effects are just almost unbelievable, okay? Because you're going to have representatives of so many different branches, really, of, of what was becoming Christianity in the early days. They're going to agree on a statement. Okay, the emperor, you know, Constantine had pulled them all together and they didn't solve everything, but they certainly kept working on it. The map of Constantinople between the 4th and 6th centuries, like I said, I love maps, but this shows you the great city of Constantine. And you're going to see several gates and you're going to see um, several things, the Forum of Arcadius and Theodosius and, and Constantine, all sorts of things there, and the walls. And, you know, if you want to study more about that, you can. But I thought you might want to see just sort of the way that Constantinople was set up during that time. And you can see ways that they're protecting themselves with the walls and the gates and all of the, the things that are surrounding them. You can see kind of how they built it and why they built it in that manner. Here we come to Theodosius. This is the guy who actually does make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Not Constantine, it's this guy. Okay, so we're going to talk about Theodosius the first, or Theodosius the Great, as he's sometimes Two sections of the empire are going to continue to do well up until the reign of the Emperor Theodosius, okay? And that's going to be from 379 to 395. And we have Constantine being the longest reigning emperor, actually, maybe ever, but I know Constantine had been the longest reigning emperor since Augustus, who also, remember, had a very long but anyway, Theodosius is in from 79 to 95. And what happens during Theodosius' term is you're going to have a lot of separation coming up between the East and the West. Now, why? Why is that? Well, there's political instability, partially because of the second bullet down there, the egotism of the two regions, okay? The, the people in the regions, each one was kind of, you know, a little bit... Um, I guess, looking down on the other one. Also, you have these Germans, okay, the Germanic peoples, many different groups of them. The Franks, who Constantine had actually allied with at some point. You're going to have the um, Lombards, and you're going to have the Ostrogoths, and the Vis Visigoths, and so many others. But the, German, the Germans, or the Germanic tribes, are coming into the empire, and it's going to be about 100 more years before the Western Empire falls, partially due to the invasion of these barbarians, as they called them, or Germanic tribes. But that's playing a role in, in what's going on here as things are not really working out that great. Okay, government corruption, we know how that works, right? Bribery and so on. Mercenaries, oh my goodness, you've got the Romans who really don't want to serve in the military a lot of them just hire mercenaries, okay? A lot of them hire Germans, and we'll, we'll talk more about that also in uh, in chapter 6 and 7 a little bit. But they'll just hire someone else. Hey, you know, I don't feel all this great ownership in Rome anymore. I don't want to go. Why do I have to go fight for my, you know, for my empire? I don't want to do that. Here, let's hire some Germans, Okay. Now, you also have a lot of slaves in the Roman Empire, and, and you see a lot of the people getting pretty lazy because they have slaves to rely on, have horrible unemployment, horrible inflation. And then we have the rise of Christianity, which is continuing to rise. And this is where, you know, again, Constantine had removed the persecution for Christians with the Edict of Milan. But Theodosius is going to be the guy who goes one step further 
and he's going to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. So now we're going to see a complete turnaround where Christianity had once been illegal and the Christians were persecuted. We're going to see that in 380 with the Edict of, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, Thessal <laughs> of course not, Thessalonica, close enough. Okay. Um, the Emperor Theodosius, known again, as I said, sometimes as the Great, because he does make Christianity the state official religion of Rome. So he's going to make the, the Christianity that was based on the Nicene Creed the state religion. Now, he goes a step further, too, and he declares worship of pagan gods illegal. And with the death of Theodosius, the next big thing happens, okay? The empire is going to be split permanently in 395. You know, Constantine had united it, and then now it's fallen apart again. Because after Theodosius dies, it's going to be split between his two sons, Arcadius and Arrhenius. And they're not going to work together, and they're each going to kind of go their own way and have, you know, claim half of the empire or whatever. But we see that the, the Roman Empire, East and West, is never going to come back together again. And part of it goes back to that last slide where we were talking about all the problems that were happening in terms of the, you know, the German invasions, in terms of the mercenaries and the lack of civic duty and all of that. So all of that contributes to this. The barbarians or the Germans okay, had been on the borders of the Roman Empire for quite a while. And again, chapter six and seven, really, we're going to talk more about those. So just a preview there, the barbarian invasions begun by the late 300s, I would argue even earlier than that, because they were already in contact with the Romans. And the West is just going to be in political turmoil, economic turmoil, imperial power and prestige, has now left Rome, and it has gone to Constantinople. Constantinople became the new Rome, okay? The city of Rome, the Western Empire, are going to be really just... I have on the PowerPoint in decline, but, you know, it, it's it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be going on for, like I said, I, I would argue at least a couple hundred years before it falls in 476. At least that's the, the date that we'd like to give you, and I'll explain why when we get there. But the city of Rome and the Western Empire were actually suffering from a lot of things, including... Poor leadership, okay? The, over in the, in the West, you're going to have, well, the emperor is going to be based out of the East. So in the West, you're going to have a lot of different groups coming in that want to participate in the Roman government or in the Roman world because they like what they've seen of Rome but they don't really know how to fit in because a lot of them are hired as mercenaries. Slide 12 is where we talk about, for the first time of many times, the official date that historians sometimes pick is the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. <coughs> this is where you have the Emperor Romulus Augustulus who's going to be overthrown by a German chieftain. You know, he, he was commander of, of some of the mercenaries made up of different tribes. But Odoacer is going to depose the German, or um, depose, I'm sorry, the emperor, Romulus Augustulus. Now, he was a young boy. He was only 15 or 16. And that's why they use the term Augustulus instead of Augustus. Augustulus means little Augustus, right? So Odoacer is placed on the throne of Rome. This is the first time that you have a German on the throne of Rome. So this is where we consider the end of the Roman Empire in the West at that time. Romulus Augustulus is considered to be, by most historians, the last Western Roman Empire, or emperor, rather. 
I'm tired. Can you guys tell? The last <clears throat> Western Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus. Now you can yeah you can read a little bit about him, but there's some you know there's some things that are really important to know about this and his you know too much about little Romulus Augustulus is not that important, but it's important for you to know that this is where we have Odoacer the German that becomes the Emperor of Rome, sort of, okay? Now, the reason I say sort of is because he had to actually ask for permission to take the throne in the West. Who did he have to ask permission from? The Emperor in the East. Remember, the, the power's gone over to the East. And so Odoacer was going to have to ask the Eastern Emperor if he could actually become you know, in charge of the West. And the shape the West was in, you know, the Western Roman Empire was in at that time, just, you know, again, almost just anarchy and just a mess, and it was economically a mess, and had been sacked and, and almost destroyed several times by this point. So I would say probably the emperor in the East was kind of like, sure, you want to be emperor over there in that part of the empire? Knock yourself out, Odo Walker. That's just me editorializing, though, of course. Slide 13 is just simply a representation, a picture of Romulus Augustulus surrendering to Odo Walker. You know, he's surrendering the insignia of the empire, and you can see how young he is. And, um, you know, this is a, a relatively famous work that I, that I think is really interesting. But then again, remember, I really like pictures and I really like representations of what the people looked like at certain times or whatever. So I think this picture is a pretty good um, representation of the way it sort of would have been as they were entering in and deposing the young boy king. This is the last slide and this is where I just touch on the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, the Eastern Roman Empire is going to continue for a long time, almost exactly a thousand years after the fall of Rome in the West. The Eastern Roman Empire is going to continue under the name the Byzantine Empire. If you've studied art, you, know, you may have studied Byzantine art, that type of thing. Now, 1453, like I said, you're going to have the Turks come in. It's where we're going to end up with Turkey. And they're going to take over Constantinople in the region, and they're going to change the name to Istanbul. And, you know, it's, it's still Istanbul to this day. And we'll talk more about that again when we, get, when we get a little bit later. 1453, very important year. So many things happen. Now, the Byzantine Empire is Eastern Orthodox Christian. Okay. They started out with the Roman Catholic Church, and then the split, the schism, that happened here was the Eastern Orthodox Church split in 1054. And there's some differences. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church uh, traditionally had Latin as the language, and especially the language for the Mass. The Eastern Orthodox Christians are going to have Greek as their language and so on. So they're, they're very much the same, very, very much the same. The Eastern Orthodox Church, the best of my knowledge, denies the authority of the Pope, and that's one of the big differences. Now, I need you to also pay attention to Justinian. Justinian was the Byzantine emperor who tried to reunite the East and the Western Roman Empire, or the East and Western Roman Empires, under his rule. And what's going to happen is he's going to come into the West marching in with his big fancy, well-trained, well, you know, equipped army. And he's coming into a wild world over in the West. He thinks it won't be any trouble to overthrow the Western Empire and conquer it and, and take control of it. And you, you would not believe that, I mean, if you were Justinian, you would not believe that those, you know, kind of, barbaric, kind of anarchist, kind of wild people over there in the West would put up 
such a fight that you were unable to take them. See, what he did when he brought his, as I said, well-trained, well-equipped army over into a place that was falling apart, he's sort of kicking them while they're down. Because as he brings his army in, I mean, they're going to be trampling over any crops that are planted. They're going to be just coming in and, and making things worse for the Romans in the West. Okay, so you just need to kind of know, and he's an interesting character too, especially his wife, if you want to read about them. But as far as the exams, okay, from this point on, they're going to be, you know, to make it easier for you guys to, to keep up and get everything done that, that you need to get done and to be able to, you know, keep your grades up and all that with everything going on. The exams are going to be based on pretty much the PowerPoints, and that's going to be it from this point on, unless something comes up that I'm not anticipating, okay? Anyway, that's the end of that one. See you on the next one.